ready to the um, inaugural meeting of Habershan here, Habershan Entrepreneurs Resources and Education. And we're just going to get right to our speaker, who is Suzanne Bingley. And Suzanne is, like many entrepreneurs, starting a business was not something early in her life career plan. Uh, her first career track was actually the Royal Navy, where she met her husband when they were serving in Scotland. Her second career came when they, um, after her children were grown, and she received an MSc in radiology, worked for hospitals in Scotland and London, eventually becoming general manager for all the imaging departments in Southeast London. Wow. I know. The things you learn. But her favorite part of work, even as in a supervisory position, was the patients. That was always her top priority. Now, when she and her husband came to the U.S. in 2010, her visa restricted her work opportunities at the time. So she turned back to a childhood love that she had learned from her grandmothers, and that was needle cramps. And she especially loved quilting, which I understand was very unusual in Scotland. It was very unusual. Extremely and, unusual. Yes. But not so in Northeast Georgia. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> and she connected with, now what was the quilting guild that you're in? I was um, a member of two quilting guilds. Okay. Um, there's the Mountain Laurel Guild in Clarksville, and I was president of the Goldbrush Quilt Guild in Cleveland. Okay. So, and like a lot of people, business actually comes out of a hobby that turns into a passion. Um, now, so as you were quilting, and um, you worked at a local store. I did, yes. Um, I, I used to go there. They used to have a session where you could go and just sit and sew and meet people. And I thought, well, I'm new to the area. We've just bought a house here. I'll go along and see if I you know, make some new friends, quilting friends. And while I was there, they said they were looking for help. I said, I can do one day a week. And then one day became two days, then three days, and yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed it, but um, there came a point where I felt I wanted to do more, and they had an idea of expanding the store, doubling their, their floor space, and we had a lot of customers coming in saying, do you sell yarn, do you sell needlework supplies, do you sell embroidery bit? and they didn't sell any of these things, it was just quilt fabric, and, and a few sort of threads and things, and I said, no, it would be a good idea to move into that area because there's obviously demand for it, but the owner didn't want to do it. Oh well, a business. And then I had a little unexpected windfall of a pension I forgot about. <laughs> I thought NHS and Health Service in Scotland had lost it or something, we had trouble tracking it down. And I'd sort of given up on it and then this pension came through and my husband George said, you know what you should do, you should open your own shop. And it, the thought terrified me. And then I thought about it, I thought, yeah, I can do it, I can do that. So, um, and that's how it started. But it didn't start just with the needlework supplies. I actually just put my toe in the water on that front. And we just had, we had the shop divided into two sides. And one side were gifts, jewelry, um, that sort of thing. And the other side was the needlework. And it soon became clear that people were only coming to us for the needlework supplies. And that's what they wanted. So we concentrated on that and we expanded that area. And it's kind of grown from there. But I, I still don't have just needlework. Um, the whole front of the shop is the non sewing part of it. And that's what people see when they walk past. And that's what the people who don't sew will come in to buy the section there in the other night. I didn't know, I thought perhaps part of this was maybe hints and tips and what not to do. Sure, as I said, we have um, some of this is from, if you want to look at this, the top 10 startup mistakes. So she's going to address some of these and how that's worked for her. I think the building something nobody wants is possibly one of the things I see happening quite a lot in small towns locally that you see a shop open because someone has a passion about something. And no different to me than I wanted to do the needlework thing. But you have to think who else might have this passion. And if it's something that is almost a niche market, you need to look at the demographics and really see if there's a market for it. Because although you're really passionate about it, I don't know, say out of the blue, a model train store. How many people 
in North Georgia would be interested in something like a modern train store. You, it might be your passion, you might live for it, but if there's only a, a handful of people interested in North Georgia, you're not going to get many customers. And you're not going to get people just dropping in because they're on vacation and, oh, that looks nice, I'll buy myself a modern train set. <laughs> so it's, it, you, you can sort of put yourself into a corner really where you're just not getting any passing business of people who might just look in the window and think that looks cute, I'll buy it, or let's find out more about it. And unless you have a website, um, and even then, there are so many huge companies that can undercut you with a website, that that's another little pitfall you may fall into, that you think you can, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll have my online sales, but there are huge companies out there who can buy in bulk and sell cheaper than you. So it's something to take into account for building something nobody wants. Um, the hiring coolie, I don't know about that because there's just me and George and I can understand the hiring coolie because he complains all the time if he has to cover for me. So, <laughs> you know, if your husband doesn't like needlework then he's going to moan when he's going to watch your shop for you. Um, but there is that problem hiring coolie that you need someone who's going to be committed and someone you can rely on. Um, I think that's a big thing that you find and I know a few local businesses have said to me that they take people on and then they may be late a lot of the time, or they call in sick a lot of the time. So you, you've got to be careful who you're hiring. Um, and I think that that is one of the reasons business is failed because they don't have reliable staff. I'm very reliable, so I'm fine. It's just me. If I don't turn up, then you know it's my own fault if the business fails. And lack of focus. Um, I guess that's just. Okay, well, I just said, yeah. Of focus. Well, they said sometimes people try to be everything to everybody, also. And that's, you know, it's one thing to specialize, pay attention to what your customers want. But if every time someone come in and asked her, well, do you have this and that? And then she added that to her stock, um, that, that could be yeah. another problem. You have to, you have to think really hard. If someone comes in and says, do you, do you sell this? You have to think, is there a market for it? If 20 people come in and ask for it, then yeah, stick your toe in the water, get a little bit of whatever it is they're looking for. But for one or two people coming in, I get the occasional request for noodle point, and it's kind of a tapestry type thing. The cheapest kits wholesale are around about $100. So I couldn't possibly spend all that money for three or four people a year maybe coming in, because I'd have to have a choice, I'd have to spend thousands to get needle point kits and supplies for three or four people coming in a year, so it, that's one where it's not worth it, but when you have customers coming back again and again saying, do you sell this, do you sell this, then that's when it's worth it, and also if you can, work with companies that will let you do small orders with either no minimum or a low minimum, because then you can custom order for people. So I do that for quite a lot of my customers who come in, they'll want a particular fabric for their embroidery. If I don't have it, I can special order it and get it within three days. And they like that. So, but you have to find a company that doesn't have a minimum. And a lot of the needlework companies have minimums of thousands. And of course it doesn't work, you can't put in a, somebody make up a $2,000 order for someone who wants a piece of cloth costing $10. But if you have companies that let you, and that was one of the points on my notes, is try to buy from companies that have either no minimum order or a very low minimum. And then you can sort of put your toe in the water, try things out, buy the minimum order. If they sell, great, you can buy more. If they don't, you've not lost an absolute fortune. You can put them on sale and move on. And we've, we've done that with a few of our non-sewing things at the front of the shop. We bought a very low order, I think $200 wholesale, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we thought, let's see how it goes. And Clarks were very country, so we weren't sure how people would, would go for things that were Tiffany and all that sort of thing. Well, they love them. So now we have a, we can reorder. There were some things they didn't buy, which I didn't get again, but for the most part, it all sold. So it's a good hint just to get a little bit of something just try it, basically try it out and see what happens. Uh, what are the, um, the adorable pieces I keep buying in the front? The animals? The rendell. The rendell. So how many of you have been in her shop in Clarksville? 
do need to stop by there, but yeah. the, the red deal is what she's got in the, in the front. And I bought, I think, a notepad mm -hmm. for a gift exchange for a church I worked at in Cleveland. And someone opened up, and like three people were like, oh, that's from Tudor Rhodes. So she's actually branded herself as far away as Cleveland. And uh, <laughs> from Clarksville. But she, so she's got local recognition, and people know what she has. They like what she has. But this is really important if you're building any kind of a retail business or even in a service based business. You have to get something somebody wants. Yeah. And you have to, and the, the, if, how many of you have watched her um, change and grow since she first started? There's been a lot of metamorphosis there, and it's all this, this um, awareness she has of what is selling, what is working. It doesn't matter if she loves it. It's if the customers love it. Yes. And I, that, that's actually a good example, Lorenda, because when we first opened the store, we had a few of their mugs, and they were really popular. So we got more mugs. <laughs> People were coming in, and of course they'd already bought some mugs, and they said, well, do you have anything else? So we just took a chance, and the company did this little display unit, probably no bigger than the top of this table, that had one or two of each things of their stationery in. And so it was called a, a starter pack for new businesses. And we got that and thought, well, you know, again, not much money lost. If people don't like the stationery, it doesn't matter. And within two weeks it had gone, apart from one notebook, I think. So we thought people really do want it. And again, that was from people coming in to saying, do you sell birthday cards? Do you sell bank cards? And we thought, let's give this a try. And now I think that's one of our, of the non-sewing, that's our top selling thing. And the, the other thing we have with that, which is a good idea, is if any company does it, get zip code protection. And I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but it means that they won't sell to anyone else within your zip code. So we have zip code protection on that and quite a few of our other items. And it's really good because it means nobody, you know, Joe Blobs across the street can't suddenly say, oh, she's selling all those cards and things. She's selling them for $4. I'll get them and I'll undercut her and I'll sell them at three fifty. Not that anyone would, but it stops that happening. It stops other stores duplicating what you're selling. Because right. all you're doing is splitting the market. And, and that is a, another thing there. to think about. Because someone else is selling it doesn't mean you should sell it because then you're just breaking up the pie. There's only a, there's a limited amount of customers out there who want whatever you're selling. And if another store starts to sell exactly the same thing or you start selling what they're selling, all you're doing is splitting them up and they'll either go one way or the other. And they could all go to stay with the old store. They could all come to you, but that's a big risk to take. And there's already an established business selling that. Fail to execute sales and marketing. And I guess that's advertising. Yes. Best advertising I've found is social media, Facebook and Instagram. That's where people find me. And Google. And um, one of the things says make sure you have a really good um, entry on Google, a good page, etc. And I don't know if anyone here has found you try to look up a business and they haven't updated their Google page and you drive for miles and they're either closed or they're not there anymore. But a lot of people find me from Google. And, and you I do know. get a lot of people that come from all over. Oh, yeah, just to say, not just Cleveland, Georgia, but sometimes Cleveland, Ohio. We have people who are on vacation. Women who sew get passionate about it. And when they're on vacation, they look up all the sewing stores that are in the area they're going to, or sometimes even just off the road they're driving on, which is what happens. And we get people who are traveling north from Florida to somewhere or south from one of the, the northern states, and they stop off. They make a detour, probably 85 or wherever, um, to come to a legal workshop, which I find slightly crazy because I don't do it, but they do, and it's wonderful. And we've now, I've now got mail order customers, although I don't have a website. They'll just call me and ask me to send them things. Um, and from Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, you name it, that state I mail to. Um, it's, it's worked out really well. And the other thing is actually focused advertising. And I, we were talking about this when we started. Um, and I, I've never had a, much luck with newspaper advertising, apart from the article they did for women in business a couple of years ago. And that worked really well because it was a feature. 
but I've never really had much luck for newspaper advertising. But I do advertise, um, and it's free, so it really doesn't matter. In the little guidebooks, again, like I say, needleworkers are fanatics, but there are little quilt shop guidebooks and needlework guidebooks that you can put your address in, telephone number, and that sort of thing. And so was by these little books, and they take them on vacation with them, and they hunt up stores to go to. So it, but the focus advertising is not what works for me, and social media. And it may be a pain, and it is a pain sometimes trying to think what to post, but I try to put something on Facebook and Instagram every day, because not all of them get through to your customers, because Facebook limits the advertising they put out. But you, you really just need to keep at it, and, and hope people spot you. And they have, and again, a lot of people see that thing on Facebook. But somebody will share it, and then you end up, you know, you get thousands of likes, and friends that you didn't even know existed will, will find you through that. Um, the next one says, not having the right co-founders. Well, that was just me and my husband, so, you know, that was kind of, that was kind of it. But I can understand that point in not having, again, it's almost like having, hiring poorly. You need to have, be with people who are committed, and who are going to support you. I think the rest of it kind of doesn't really apply as such to me, the chasing investors and certainly that because it was again just this, this small windfall I had. But not making sure you have enough money it is a good point because you've always got to think, and I know nobody wants to think of that, but you've always got to think of what happens if I lose it all and can I afford to lose all of this? Because it's, it's great to go in and think I'm going to make a huge success of this and I certainly didn't. And I thought, well, let's see how it goes. But you have to be prepared that you may lose most of what you've invested in that business. And think, can I manage with, with, with If all this fails, what am I going to do? Do I have enough money to pay the bills? What's my alternative? Um, and the other thing is making sure you can make enough money from your stock. And a little while ago, there was a store next door to us, and I don't know if anyone here was involved in it, the, the beef jerky store, mm -hmm. and he opened the store and didn't really have an awful lot of stock in there, I didn't think, and it was mainly beef jerky, so it was part of that, not so much building something nobody wants, but he didn't have a lot of stock and it was again very focused on one area, because not everybody wants beef jerky. But if you added up, and I remember looking one day and thinking, I'm not sure how he makes his rent, because even if he sold everything he has in this store, I'm not sure that's the value of even one month's rent. So you have to make sure that when you, you have an amount of stock in there that you can sell to make enough to cover your rent and replace it and make some money. If you're hiring, you've got to pay salaries, etc., and social security, all those sort of things. So you have to have enough stock to sell over a month so that you can cover your bills, replace that stock, and make something above that, both for salaries, etc. And I think that might have been his mistake, but he just didn't buy enough at the beginning and fill the shop. All right, well, does anybody have any questions for Suzanne? mainly um, to give them more choice. The customers who were coming in um, were wanting the needlework supplies because there is no other shop in the whole of North Georgia that sells embroidery threads or the whole range of the, the embroidery thread brand I sell. And it was just from people coming in, I needed to offer them more choice and I needed to have everything they needed. And when I first started out, I was selling it more in just kit form, thinking that it would be mainly for tourists, mm -hmm. and that locals would be buying online or going to the big box stores. And my, when I first thought about it, I thought, well, people are just going to go to Gainesville. They're going to go to the big stores in Gainesville. They're not going to come here, because their prices are cheaper. 
But actually, it turned out that people would do anything rather than drive to Gainesville. Yeah. And, and with gas being what that, it is today. Exactly. Day. Now, it's even, I hate to say it, but it's even better for yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, because people who, who would have driven to Gainesville to save 20 cents on their gloss, and I think, why well, should I? And one of the reasons, I've got the whole range of the most common, the most popular brand of embroidery thread. And one of the reasons for getting every color was that when I was sewing, I'd need a particular color, a color number. And I'd drive all the way down to Gainesville, only to find that they didn't have it. So then you'd drive down to Buford, and you'd be coming to the United States. For something that costs then, was cost about 50 cents, it's now 75 cents. So you're driving all that way for one thing that costs 75 cents that you need for your project. And you can't buy it online when you can. But then you've got to have a minimum order of $100 to get free shipping. And then you're tempted to spend that $100 on things you don't need or spend five bucks for the shipping. Whereas you can just now drive into Parkstow and pick it up. For about, I think I sell them now for about five cents more than they do in Gainesville. And I think that's worth it to save the gas and pass on the driving there. And I, and I think it's hugely important that you, that you brand yourself and have an identity. That, yes. That people know what you're doing and what you have there. And the very best property to testify to that. We just have a store closed across the street. It started out as uh, yes. specialty olive oils and vinegar. And then all of a sudden, they're serving lunch. It's like, what? Yes. That was the that was a lack yeah, of like, focus because every time I went in, it's like, what is this a coffee shop or is it? A, and again, you can't yeah. you get yourself spread so thin, you have no identity. Mm -hmm. Right. So there was it appeared to me as some stores have done here, they haven't survived. Is they're grasping at straws mm -hmm. to try to figure out how to get my yeah. business up, rather than doing it rationally and logically like you've done and, and been successful with. Yeah. It. Um, there needs to be what we're doing here, training for, for new folks wanting to start a business. You know, yeah. People are all the same. Well, I want to start a business. Mm -hmm. or I want to start a restaurant. It's like, yeah. well, have you ever had any experience with it? No. I like to cook. But my mama told yes. me how to cook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big difference between cooking at home and cooking for lots of people. I love cooking, but I hate cooking when it's a big group of people yeah. because there's more could go wrong when you've got large quantities of things and your timing is sort of opening a restaurant, your timing when you're cooking could be perfect. Cooking at home for yourself, it doesn't matter if dinner's 10 minutes late, right. does it? But or if yeah, you burn the biscuits. Or if you burn the biscuits, nobody <laughs> cares, exactly. But if your catering is, is completely different from cooking. But I think to that point, I think it is nice to have a group like this because when people say, well, do you have any experience? And then you say, no, I don't. And it's turned off or the door is shut or seemingly shut. It's very, you know, it's very um, disheartening. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you think, well, I, but I can learn. If somebody else did it once, then I can do it once and I can learn. And so, and I think that's where a lot of mistakes come in because if somebody, people are trying to learn, they're trying to start a business, but they need help, but there's nowhere to go and nowhere to get the resources from people that are willing to help, then yeah, they do shut down. They don't know what they're supposed to do, so it didn't get done. But if there was some mentorship and like, okay, well, you know, let's find you some management. Let's, you know, these are the things we need to make sure are covered. I think this would be a lot more successful because people are gonna try. If they have the, you know, if they have the, the will, they're gonna try. And it may fail because there wasn't any leadership or guidance so I think I one mean, of the, the good things to do is to, if you want to, say you wanted to open, I don't know, a coffee shop like this, coffee and donut shop, is actually go and offer your services for free for a while. Go and offer to work there. Or see if they want paid help, but if they don't, go and work there. See what it's really like and do everything. You know, clean up, work at the, the register, ask if you can help look at, you know, with accounts and that sort of thing and the actual business side of it. So get, Find out what it's really like to do everything. Because if you're opening your business, you may have to do all that. Um, but another thing is to know, I mean, it is very hard when you're doing a business to know what you don't know. You know, you go, yeah, okay, I'm gonna open a business. Well, did you know there's building codes? Did you know there's health inspections? <laughs> did you know there's, you know, the, I mean, hiring people is very complicated now. The legalities, the finances of it, you know, we're managing a payroll, 
um, there's so many things and you can't know how to do all of it and you shouldn't. And that's where, you know, even Steve Johnson, you know, do what you do best and delegate the rest. Right. If you like bacon pies, keep baking your pies and let someone else handle your paperwork. Right. And those kinds of things. But this is what we're hoping to do because that's something I've seen in Clarksville is some of these businesses, they, you know, you, you see them there and a year later they're gone. And you think, well, their lease must be up and they didn't make it. And sometimes you have a pretty good idea why they didn't make it, but I think it's great um, that, that people are coming into this and we've got business leaders that are also, and we have actually talked about a mentorship program. Um, so this is what we hope to do is find people um, and work together so that the businesses that stay here, grow here, and thrive here. So I'm going to turn this off. And the other important thing that she mentioned, and having 